So my name's Chris Thompson. I'm the executive director for now here at Generator, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to actually the last public lecture of the Jumpstart art series, which has been fantastic. Uh, and once again, I want to um, thank and say congratulations to our cohort. Can the cohort wave? Yay. OK, this is important. So the cohort is actually graduating like in two weeks. And the graduation ceremony is actually a big party for everybody called the Humbug, which is our holiday party. We're going to have 30 artists, craftspeople, and, and uh, other creative people in here um, selling work. We're going to have a live band. We're going to have, as always, free uh, booze and, and food and everything. And, uh, and, and, but they're actually, their graduation, you know, after you know, working through this you know, nine-week boot camp of, of um, entrepreneurship for creatives, uh, is to actually sell work. So I'm hoping you guys can all come. It's, it's, a fun, it's a crazy fun party. It was fantastic last year. And, uh, and so that'll be the graduation ceremony for them. But it's, it's been fantastic, and the cohort has been amazing this year. Um, so the theme tonight is uh, galleries and the retail model. How to be successful working, you know, we've, we've talked about, so far we've talked about a DIY model. Um, we've talked about uh, the sort of the nonprofit contemporary art world. We've talked about art finances, all sorts of different things. Now we're gonna talk about sort of what a lot of people think is really the art world. And the secret we've learned here, everybody, it's just one of many art worlds. There are all sorts of different world, art worlds, and each one has their own rules. As before, the trick and sort of the secret that we're going to be doing here is we're going to be trying to figure out what the unspoken rules that you don't usually find out as an artist until you get into that art world are for being successful in this art world, which is the, the gallery world. So um, I'm going to introduce our panel in just a second, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So first off, uh, the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, the Kaufman Foundation is, is a large entrepreneurial um, organization, national. I think they're a $6 billion organization, which is fine with me. Uh, and we got a grant through the mayor's office uh, to actually hold this. And actually, one of the key people at the Kaufman Foundation came to Burlington. And he actually spent a huge amount of time. It was nearly late for his big lecture at Generator, and he said, you know, he thought the Generator was actually pretty unique nationally, and he called us, and I'm never going to remember this, we are a hub for creative entrepreneurial ecosystems. Yeah. And so he thought that, uh, so, welcome to a hub for creative entrepreneurial ecosystems, right? You know, so it's, it's actually interesting. But this is what you're at right now is what he thought was important, because we like to convene places where people can actually come and talk about ideas and actually learn, but also, you know, get together as a group of people um, who are sharing their secrets and, and uh, sharing their, their creative stuff. So that's great. That's really cool. So, Coppin Foundation, the mayor, the mayor's office have been fantastic. Uh, we really want to thank them. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Maru Weinberger is a, is a big supporter and everybody else in the mayor's office, so it's fantastic. Uh, the, Vermont Arts Council. Uh, they've been really supportive of this, uh, and, and I'm really thrilled to have them as a, as a sponsor. Davis and Hodgkins Associates um, CPA, they actually gave the lecture last week, and you know it's successful if you can get 32 people here to talk about accounting. So uh, that was a, a really fun thing. Okay, the beer and pizza doesn't help. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, but we also have a bunch of individual sponsors I want to thank. I want to thank Val Hurd. I want to thank Pat Robbins and Lisa Schamberg. I want to thank Michael Metz and Denise Shakirjan. I want to thank David Raphael and Nicole Cartagen. Uh, all those folks have, have gotten together to, to make this possible. And now. So um, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, Mark Wasco. Mark Wasco is, um, what's my favorite quote? At one point you used to say, I'm like the only collector in Vermont. It's you never said. said it's not true, but you are a major collector, and and you're actually a very generous collector that you share your collection and, and have people come uh, welcome people to to uh, look at it often and uh, um, and thank you for that. That's fantastic. Courtney Record is another Jumpstart graduate, right? Yep. The first you were in the first cohort. Mm -hmm. And Courtney, uh, well, she'll tell you a little bit about work, but she makes this fantastic jewelry at the same time being a data scientist. Okay, can I say data scientist? Well, data science artist data person. Data visualization artist. 
Sarah Beale is, is <laughs> it's true. She's going to tell you all about it. Sarah Beale is uh, one of the founders of Commandeer right in town here, an amazing place for makers with beautiful uh, work, and she knows all about running a gallery. So, so, um, so the format is, as we've done before, uh, is essentially what I noticed as a, so, Okay, we'll go back through this again real quick. So as a curator, I, um, I came in I, to be a curator from being an artist. And, uh, and I had thought there were all of these firm rules about how to be a successful artist. Uh, and then I became a curator and I realized I was all wrong, right? You know, the rules are totally different than you think they're going to be. And so one of the other things I, I realized when I was first becoming an artist was that um, I thought that uh, graduate school, getting an MFA, uh, you go to graduate school and they teach you how to be a successful uh, uh, artist and run a successful art business. And that is not true. In fact, they do everything but that, which is kind of ironic. So, um, so, but what I noticed was that artists get together, and this happened to me. I was a curator, and I was actually with a fairly, I was showing a, a fairly famous artist with a, a person who's now one of the, one of the big um, uh, gallerists in New York City, very successful people. And they, you talk to the artist, you talk to the gallerist um, out in the real world, and they're, you know, they're, you know, art is about spirituality, and it's about you know all of these sort of very conceptual and, and, and very important uh, concepts. And you get in a bar with them, and they're talking strategy. And I'm like, hold it. You know, you're pretending none of this stuff works. And they got right down to business. And I was a fly on the wall listening to it. I'm like, oh, this is what happens. Artists get together quietly, and they talk about what the real rules are, and they talk about how to become successful, and they talk about you know, the strategy of, of, of doing all this. So what we're pretending here is that we are four friends hanging out in a bar with 30 or so of our other friends hanging around at the same time. And we have to be a little bit careful because you know, we don't want to use names. Our, our first speaker actually asked me not to share the video because she realized she'd used a few too many real names. And, uh, but we want to be honest about, you know, about what it takes to be successful, about how things work. And so that's it. This is like a, a very private but not private talk amongst, uh, amongst a bunch of friends. Does that make sense? So what I was going to ho hope we could do is we'll pr start with Sarah, and we're going to go through, and we're going to actually have, um, you're going to take, you know, five, ten minutes, talk about your background, how you got where you are. But if you could, if you could end up with... A, a couple things that you found out along the way that were not the way you thought they were and are essentially fundamental rules about how to become successful uh, in your uh, art world, but also kind of, particularly for you, what you're looking for as a gallerist. Cool, cool. thank you. Uh, There's a switch on, got it. That's on, okay, all right, great. Um, so I'm Sarah, uh, I founded Commandeer with my mom, uh, which is, Running a business with your mom is exactly what you would imagine it to be. Some days are great, some days suck. Um, but anywho, we found it about six years ago. Um, running a retail shop is a lot of work. Um, and then you add the layer of everything being USA made. Uh, we're working with makers that are making one thing and the order is $100. And then we are working with huge manufacturers that are making things in the US. Um, where the order is, you know, four or five thousand. So that stuff, that big spread, creates a lot of work for us. Um, but our main headquarters, um, if anyone has not gone, um, please go there. Small Business Saturday is on Saturday. Um, it is on the corner of College and South Winooski, uh, and we also have an online store. Uh, which we sell a bunch of things as well. Um, but our bread and butter is the store itself. Uh, my background before uh, opening a retail shop was in technology and um, website management, um, so, so uh, providing solutions for small business. I've always been obsessed with small um, and making it easier for small businesses to market themselves um, and find who they are and their brand. Um, so it kind of makes sense that I've found my way to this retail shop where I retail things like Courtney Records um, jewelry, um, where I'm helping the small business in a very direct, concrete way. Um, in terms of my tips and t for the trade, it's kind of hard to probably limit that. Um, my biggest thing is for makers to learn to keep it simple. So instead of having 40 SKUs for one particular item, 
know what things sell the best um, and realize that there is choice, um, kind of a confusion over if there's too many choices, people will freak out and just walk away from it. So really keep it simple. Um, know that the retailer is looking to get 50% margin on everything, if not more. If they can't get that, they're probably gonna walk away. Um, let me write, write down other things here. Uh, research, so like figure out who of the retailers out there are a good fit for you and go after them. Don't just blindly go after everyone. It's not gonna be um, as effective. It's better for you to have five really strong wholesale accounts than 20 that never reorder because the amount of work that you have to put into those 20, not worth it. Same thing for us as a retailer. If we have to pick up 20 new makers and there none of them turn into reorders, that's, that's really a lot of work for us. Um, and then also the, a big thing that we run into now that um, online is uh, a bigger thing and like people can market through Instagram is that we compete with our makers. And so we want you to succeed, but please don't discount nonstop. If you're discounting and we're not discounting your products, you're, you're bringing your product down. Um, obviously, there's times during the year where everyone's discounting, Small Business Saturday, Black Friday, great. Um, but if you can coordinate when you're discounting your things, um, that is really helpful to wholesale accounts. Um, I could keep going, but I will not. I will stop. <laughs> All right. Can, oh, that sounds good. Um, it's fun for me to hear your <laughs> your tips too, because you know I'm on the other side of it. I'm Courtney Record, and I make uh, topographical jewelry. So I use USGS data to make um, landscapes that you can take with you. So it's really fun, and I like it a lot. And I've been doing it for a couple of years. Before that, I was an art teacher. And so now I've transitioned into making jewelry and I also do information design, which Chris referenced, which is what I do with jewelry. It's um, making data visible, but people don't think about it that way. So I also do 2D information visualization. Um, and I was thinking a lot about this, like what are my tips? Um, some of them overlap w w with what you were saying, um, but I think I have a couple things that I actually wrote down my notes. Um, so one is put yourself out there as much as you can. So that, that means like, you know, put yourself on Instagram, talk to people, show people your work because you never know who you're talking to and who they know. Um, I've definitely gotten a few wholesale accounts from, you know, a friend whose sister owns a gallery near Zion and then she bought Zion work from me and that worked out really well. And then someone else who saw me at the farmer's market, you know, she works at a little shop and they started carrying my work. And so I think really just putting, continuously putting yourself out there is really helpful. You just don't know. Um, so say yes to opportunities where you can, um, where you can do that. Um, Secondly, um, so don't be afraid to approach shops and galleries. I think uh, if you're confident in your work and you feel like it's a good fit, exactly what you were saying, then they, you know, it's, it's not just like, oh, they're doing you a favor by carrying your work. You, you're also, if it's a good fit, then it's, it's mutually beneficial for everyone. You know, they can make some money, you can make some money and they're representing someone they believe in, and you're working with a place that you believe in. So um, my recommendation is, and I don't know, I, I'd love to hear your feedback on this, go stop by in person and be flexible. If Stop by at a non-busy time, yes. and you know, <laughs> like not this week, not like until February. Um, February. Yes, <laughs> like in the morning on a Monday. Like, you know, just like at the least busy time you possibly can, and also be flexible. Like if the person you want to talk to isn't there, then be willing to set up a meeting. But I think having some face-to-face -face contact is nice. But, you know, be persistent but not annoying. I think there is a line, but I think if someone actually knows you and sees you, it's, it can be helpful. But also be prepared, like come with information, you know, your price sheets and your wholesale information, don't just show up, you know, and be disorganized, because that's gonna represent you really not well. Um, so that is another suggestion. 
and um, and then I think the the two other things I wanted to say are be some places you know be prepared some places will want to go you know especially galleries I've found uh, they might ask you to do consignment so you have to decide ahead of time if that's going to work for you uh, and that is, it can be a lot of work as far as on your end to manage what have you sent them, did you get paid, what are you sending them next? That is a lot of work. You may want to try it or say, hey, I'm willing to try this for a little while, and then we'll switch to wholesale and see if they're open to that. But I think knowing that that is a possibility, know ahead of time, are you willing to do that or not? Um, and then in terms of when you're contacting places, pay attention and keep track. Make a spreadsheet or however you do it. Um, I like spreadsheets. Um, of who you talk to, when you talk to them, what their contact information is, you know, email, phone, what the date was, what they said. Because then when you, you're not going to contact them like a minute later. You want to give them time, you know, oh, they said, to contact them in February on Monday morning at 10 a.m. Okay, great. So you write that in and put it, you know, by email. <laughs> okay. Um, but pay attention and keep track of those things so that you're not like, oh, who was that? What was the name of that person? Because if you know their name, it, it's helpful. Um, and then keep in touch and get feedback. Like, how's my work doing? Do you have any feedback? You know, get suggestions. And I think keeping that communication open is really, really helpful. And, and just, because I've gotten some great ideas for new things from people. So it's like, oh, I didn't ever think of that. And I may make something new because of feedback I got. So don't be afraid to, to ask for that as well. So that's it. Hi, I'm Mark Wasco and um, I'm an art collector. And uh, I've been doing it for about 21 years. And it all started with this uh, event called the South End Art Hop that some of you may have heard about, which is now the largest visual art event in the state of Vermont. And um, I went on a blind date after I got divorced, and the date sucked, but the art was fantastic. <laughs> and it was like an inoculation that took, and um, it seems like every year since then the collection has grown by about 1,000 pieces. So currently there are about 23,000 artworks resident in my little um, village that I call my space, my collecting space. And I also have a reference library that's about half that size um, as a complement to create context for it. And um, what, I, what I do in my spare time is work uh, because I have to do something to support the habit. And I'm a financial planner um, and I tell all my clients that they exist so that I can buy art. Um, and uh, I've been doing that very seriously since 1979. So that actually is a long-standing thing that goes even further back than the art collecting. I've always been a collector. My dad was a collector. Um, and um, he collected very different things than I do. But the spirit of collecting and the camaraderie that we had doing stuff together is uh, probably part of the reason that I collect, because it reminds me of those times. My father died uh, the summer after my freshman year in college when I was just 16. So um, this is a way of um, reliving some of those things. Although I have to admit, I really like art. Um, and I like um, creating spaces that are fun to be in and that are very um, motivational. And so, um, hints. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of hints. I will say that my end of the, of the world is kind of at the other end of the spectrum. I tend to um, inhabit a lot of fine art galleries in major cities. I go to art fairs around the world. And um, uh, if you are of an artist persuasion where you're liable to be doing that, let me give you some hints about that. Um, do not bring your artwork into a gallery without permission. Um, you should um, probably spend some time looking at a variety of different galleries and trying to determine if your work might or might fit into that ecosystem. Um, then once you've ascertained that, make sure that there isn't an artist filling an ecological niche that is exactly what you do, because they've got one of those already. But if your work is complementary but not too similar, there might be an opportunity for you. And then spend some time becoming familiar with the program of that gallery. And then after you've done that for a while, try to engage the gallerist in some conversation. Um, sending mail to galleries 
Uh, it could work, but any gallery that's been around for any length of time probably has two to 3,000 submissions a month. And unless you know someone or they know someone that you know, the chances are it's going to end up in a circular file. So you're better off making a personal connection or finding someone that you know that knows someone that they know. Or even better, that's them. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing not to do is when you're in a show, do not put price on request on a piece that you might want to sell. Um, if you think you're scared to talk to the public, the public is mortified to speak to you. Um, because you have an advantage that they don't have. You speak art. They do not speak art. At least they don't think they speak art. And, and many of them are quite correct. They really don't. So they are not going to approach you because they don't want to be put in the position of thinking that the work is a $20 work or a $50 work or even a $500 work and asking you about it. And then you say, I'm so glad you're interested. It's $10,000. And then they have to shrink into ant size and crawl away. So um, if you are not proud of the prices you're charging, change them. And if you're proud of the prices you're charging, put them on there. And don't make people guess. Um, it is very difficult to get sales, and that's not a phenomena that's limited to Vermont. It's everywhere. Art is a intangible, it's a conceptual thing. It's not mandatory, I think it is. But most people do not believe it's like a utility or a food or clothing, it's not part of Maslow's hierarchies. It, it is, but we won't tell them that. Um, so it is, it is um, difficult enough to get people to buy art when you give them everything they need to make an appropriate decision. So don't relieve them of their opportunity to do that by not putting all the data on your um, labels that you might want to put on there to help them to make the decision. One other thing, it always helps to have the artists themselves articulate about the work. People love talking to artists about their work. And that's one of the things that I really love about working with living artists. They're living. So you can talk with them. Um, once they're dead, I mean, you can hold a seance, but the reception around here is not that good. So you, you really want to be able to speak with artists while they're alive and have them tell you why they did what they did and what they were thinking. After they're gone, it's going to be guesswork, and you really don't know unless it's been documented. Um, so those are just a few things that, that come to mind. Um, in terms of um, being a collector, I will tell you perseverance is a virtue. Some of the best things that I've purchased were not for sale. <laughs> we're going to get back to that. OK, so um, a couple things I heard. First off, um, pricing. I heard about discounting over here, and that's a no-no, right? Um, but when you're talking anywhere from $50,000 up to $10,000, because of course it's, it's, it's ephemeral, right? You know, there's an aspect of that. Um, how do you determine price? I'll start. So we find it often where makers are undervaluing their work um, and they're not accounting for the number of hours that they're putting into an item. Um, we'll sometimes have, like we have this program that um, is called the This is Vermont um, Art, Com um, Art Competition um, and we have people submit artwork um, and we then buy it from them and they produce it and all that stuff. It's kind of, it's exactly what we usually do normally with the store, but um, usually <laughs> it's just another way But this way is public, packaging. right? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's just another way we package how we get makers um, and artists. Anyways, I would say 75% of the people that submit artwork are underpricing themselves and we will, when we pick them, um, if they win, we will say, we're gonna pay you this much for this artwork, and we're gonna charge this much for it. You need to change your prices, because we're gonna charge more for your stuff. Um, sometimes people don't wanna budge on that, but I, you know, they're like, I sell it this much, I, you know, I'm like, give yourself more money. Um, and then on the opposite side of the spectrum, there's definitely things that we see the price of, and we're like, ooh, I don't know if we can do that. Um, the customer's the same way, so retailers just, one big customer. So, um, yeah, pricing's big, but leave room for yourself to make money. Yeah. Yeah, I second that. Um, it's, I think, the hardest thing, actually, is pricing your work. Um, I've gotten maybe better about that. I'm not sure. I think so, after learning how many expenses there are and how many other things go with it 
and how many hours you spend on things that aren't necessarily just creating the work. Um, so I think, and, and then initially you have to think, oh, okay, if I am gonna be going after wholesale accounts, I need to make sure that I am pricing my work the final price, the retail price, I am going to get half of that for the wholesale. And, you know, and I don't really discount my work rarely ever um, because I think it's worth it and that is what I charge. Um, but I do think that there, you have to think about that ahead of time. If you are planning on doing wholesale, you have to account for that in your pricing and know that that is part of the scheme um, and I don't know. I think just doing the best you can to, to uh, account for the hours that you're spending and then add on some hours because you know that you're doing book, bookkeeping and other things that aren't necessarily related but are still business-related um, time. Can I add to that too, just to take away some of the mist from my answer, I guess? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, with, so say with Courtney's earrings, so she has, say it takes you two hours to produce one set of earrings, mm -hmm. if that, I don't know if that's the case, but anyways, so you have to kind of figure out how much your time is worth to figure out, you know, where that number is, and then since you're going after wholesale accounts, I'd say that when you make your full margin, you sell it direct to consumer, then you're factoring in, okay, I got to do fulfillment, and I got to do all of these things, right. which is where that direct to consumer sale makes sense, but making sure you make money on the, okay, I've got two hours into these earrings, when I sell it to Commandeer, I need to make sure I'm making all of my time on that one pair of earrings, and then you can multiply it out. Yeah. So, that's yeah. Fine. And then, I'll, can I add something else too? Yes, please. Um, so, the, the hard part is that some things aren't as straightforward, right? Because you're, I'm, I might design something and then it gets, it has multiple, many, many steps. And so I think if you can spend even just a chunk of time, like a day or two or a week, really like doing the lawyer thing or keeping track of like your six minute increments, like, okay, I spend this much time plus this much time. Cause that's one thing artists are pretty bad at is like knowing how much time it took them to do something, but just do it for a little bit of time. And then you know, oh, okay, I spent, six minutes here, but then I spent 32 minutes here, and then, you know, it's not all gonna happen at once. So, yeah, really keeping track of your time. And then, yeah, deciding how much do I wanna pay myself mm -hmm. for this time? And, and really account for all of that in what you make. So, you know, when you're learning arithmetic and you learn that one and one is two, and then when you learn calculus, you realize that a lot of the crap they told you was BS. And a lot of the stuff you heard to start with doesn't necessarily carry forward. So I'm going to unintentionally um, be the heretic and tell but you But you're that also in a different art world. I was just going to say, in the non-production art world, uh, what has historically been called fine art, which is a horrible term, and I'm not trying to be elitist, it's just a different, it's a different way of looking at things. The time that one puts into the work has absolutely no bearing on the pricing. Um, and in fact, it is, um, there's a phrase that a friend of mine uh, has, in fact, I own a piece of art that he did, and it, and it reads, reality is the tiniest constituent of the truth. Um, I, uh, yeah, what, what really has to, has, to, has to do with pricing is the exposure that you and your artwork have, your resume, the way that your gallery or yourself is promoting your career and your work, and what the last and best price record you have for your work is. So in other words, it's, I, I, and I say this very respectfully, selling art's a lot like selling drugs. Um, I know you weren't expecting that. Um, so when you start out, you, you just give it away. And then as people become more dependent on it, you raise the prices. <laughs> and that really is the Reader's Digest history of how art is sold in the real world. So as people come to know, if you're a Picasso, uh, when you first started out, you were hungry and you were lean and mean, and now your doodles on a napkin are worth you know, $200,000. And so that's really how it works. In, in, the, in the bigger world, at 40,000 feet, when you're looking at art, recognition is everything, secondary market is everything, and so how well known your work is 
has to do with how well known your work is. I know that sounds like circular reasoning, but it's true. And so, um, you know, when you're first starting out and you're in a local store, um, all the things they're telling you are absolutely true. Once you get past that, it has nothing to do with it. Um, and so, um, but I, I have um, just through 21 years of living, you know, I, I, I spend almost all my time looking at art and talking about art and buying art and thinking about art. And so I kind of have some in, internal gestalt about pricing. I've given a number of uh, seminars on pricing for artists and uh, usually in, in conjunction with SIVA, once in conjunction with Studio Place Arts um, in Central Vermont. And, um, you know, basically pricing, there's a, there's a pecking order. And at the top end is oil on linen, and at the bottom is graphite on paper. And the medium that you use determines uh, a range of prices, and then how successful you become and how well known you become determines the actual pricing. The size is a, is a, is a factor, uh, all things being equal. A larger piece is worth more than a smaller piece. Well, I'm not expecting these things to make sense to you intuitively or logically. It's just, it is the code. Um, in, in the real world. And so um, in terms of pricing, I think you have to figure out what your goals are with your own work. How important is it for your work to get out there? Everyone has a different relationship to money. In fact, money is one of those things that really doesn't have any absolute value other than what you're told it's worth. It's totally relative um, commodity. So, so um, your relationship to money is going to be different than someone else's relationship to money. So your your need to get your work out could be based upon um, how much you'd like to see your work hanging around town. It could be based upon the fact you feel that people that are exposed to your work um, directly have happier lives. It could be that you think you're doing something really original and creative and you really want to get it out there so that people can be exposed to it. Um, you may want to project your career to a bigger um, platform. Uh, and, and then you may also be totally motivated by money. There's, and there are many, 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 many other permutations and combinations. So the first thing I would say to you is what's important to you? Why are you making the work? Why are you thinking about doing more than just making it and getting it out there? And what would you like to see happen to it? Because as you mentioned earlier, there, there are many different art worlds. And it is possible to be critically successful and financially a wreck. It is possible to be really successful in certain areas of art, and yet you'll never get covered by Art in America, Art Forum, Art News, or any other critically important magazine because you're working in the equivalent of 19th century landscapes. A lot of people do that. Um, and, and you may get a lot of money for your work, but you'll never be critically successful. Um, and so you have to figure out, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What does art mean to me, and what is it about? And that's an, an exercise a lot of people don't go through. And I think it's worth having a discussion with yourself about before you even think about pricing. And then once you've got that down, that'll help to clear some of the cobwebs about pricing too. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about with the um, cohort early on is, you know, congratulations, you guys have all picked probably the most difficult career path in the world. So, you know, that you have to really know what you're trying to get out of it because, you know, the, you know, you could, Try to be a you know, a rock star or a basketball star, and you'd have a better shot at it. So, um, one question I had in listening to that was: Is it possible to um, to end up charging too much and get in trouble? Because I've heard a rule from gallerists that one, you can never lower your price. And I want to um, the story I have is uh, Julian Schnabel. I don't know if you know. Uh, he was the the famous artist who broke plates and painted and all that sort of stuff. Um, at one point. Thank God he was a, a better filmmaker than he was an artist because at one point his you know he he got his prices were too high and he was no longer as popular and he had to actually you know he was pretty much driven out of the art world for for a while. That might not be an accurate assessment of that, but anyway, but is it possible to you know to end up charging too much and get yourself in trouble um, because your other galleries don't want you to lower prices? Can we start? Um... So. I think that's the problem we run into right now with like everyone feeling the need to discount. And so everyone's pricing themselves high so that like when you say there's a discount, you're gonna sell more. And so I just argue with that and like know your know what your brand is valued at um, and kind of stick with it. I do think that you can overprice, um, but I haven't run it too too often we do have obviously we go to trade shows um, run into a lot of uh, companies that are you know marketing to a different 
audience than our Vermonters um, in New York City. They're they're pricing things at a much higher price, but they know their customer. So I think it's just knowing where your market is uh, and pricing it for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking two things about this. There's the places that do discount all the time. Like, I don't know if you all know Moo, the card. Maybe they make business cards. Oh, yeah. They are always having a sale. So if you're that person, then someone says, they're never going to buy your thing at the whole, at the, the actual price. They're, they're just going to wait for a sale. So um, I think, yeah, just our, our, <laughs> our big message so far is beware of discounting. Um, but I think... I mean, I think about that because although my jewelry is not fine jewelry, you know, like gold with diamonds, although I do the, do that, it's not mostly that. It's on the higher end of jewelry that's sold around here. Uh, and so sometimes I worry. I'm like, oh my God, this person's over here, they're going to $20. I'm like, okay. But it, I wouldn't pay myself $10 an hour to do it. And I, so people, they value what I'm making, it's unique, and they're paying the prices that I'm charging, and I feel pretty comfortable about that. I, I do worry when I increase my prices. I'm like, oh. Um, <laughs> but so far, I, I, I don't double them or triple them. I just increase them, and then people still buy my work, and so that, oh, Gwen is back there. <laughs> She's, uh, I love Gwen, she works with me at CWE, and she's always like, charge more. She's my cheerleader for charge more. So I see her, I see her face back there. Um, <laughs> and so I think having confidence, it's again getting back to having confidence in your work and believing in what you're making and the uniqueness of what you're offering um, and also having respect for yourself and paying yourself as an artist because I think there's a, um, I guess coming from being an art teacher Art in schools, let's put it mildly, is undervalued. <laughs> yeah. um, so a, as an art teacher, you know, there's a, there's a value, uh, there's a, a lack of value. Oh, can you do this for me? Can you calligraphy this for me? Can you do this? And I'm like, no, like, sorry. Um, because I have respect for my time and I have already a million things to do as a teacher. And I think that that sentiment kind of carries through where people just think because you're an artist you want to do that thing and so they shouldn't have to pay you for it and I think what are we going to ask like you know a banker to give us money just because I, I don't know I just think as artists you have to really stand your ground and say no I'm worth it I'm, I'm really I'm worth it and not you know charge twenty thousand dollars right out of the gate because as Mark says it's like yeah you have to really earn that and understand your place in the whole ecosystem but I do think there is a, a lot of people do undervalue their work um, so um, I find artists do both things in in the in the world that I inhabit um, it seems like artists are just as prone to overcharging as undercharging. And because I've looked at so much art, I have a pretty clear vision based upon the point of development of where the artist is in their career. Um, if they're you know, emerging or mid-career or as I like to call it, submerged, um, what the pricing might be for um, the work that, um, that, they're, that they're showing me and that I'm considering. And, I routinely get into the dialogue with them about pricing. Um, some, some of the people in the audience I've purchased things from, and I mean, I think it's pretty common for, for me to, to say, well, tell me why you feel that you should be charging that, and, 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 and how much have you sold at that price level, and let's talk about it. And, and I also have a tendency to buy in bulk, because if I really like an artist's work, um, then I'm going to want to get a representation from each of the periods that, that cause them to become who they are now. And so I'll usually buy like 10 or 15 or 20 things. Um, and so then I, I usually will try to get a discount because I think that's appropriate. 
and and I and I have a long history even with dealers that are kind of sticky about that sort of stuff getting discounts when you're buying multiple things. It's like if you bought five automobiles, you'd pay a lower price per automobile than if you just bought one. It's just the way math works. So so it seems like the right thing to do. But I don't ask for discounts just to be um, a jerk. I I um, you know if I think the the work is is worth it. I, I have just recently paid more than someone asked for something because I thought they were undervaluing the work. And I, w I bought this beautiful copper sculpture that an artist in the South End did. I saw it at Art Hop, in fact, this year. And um, I remembered it to be $350. And I came back and I said, $350? And he said, $275. I said, $350 it is. And I, and, I, and I wrote the check for $350, which I thought was still a bargain, you know. And he was thrilled. And, and I still thought, and I told him, I said, I think, I think you can get more for this. And he told me that it, that wasn't his objective. So he was clear about that. Um, but he did get a, a bonus from me. So, so I, you know, I, th I think, I think it's, um, pricing is a little tricky, but um, uh, it's something that you can work through. You know, um, if you really want to become a student of pricing, just start observing things around the neighborhood. Uh, go to other places when you're traveling and make a point of spending a couple of hours in a place where you can see things that are relatable to you and what you're doing, if that's possible, and see what people that seem to know what they're doing charge for it, and find out what it is, and then you'll have a larger fact-based database from which to build um, uh, your menu of, of the way you might charge for your own work. I second that. Go do your research. <coughs> Would somebody in the audience like to ask a question? <coughs> I'm just curious what you think when, about when, <clears throat> if you have pieces that haven't sold, you're not sure anyone's that interested, but they may be interested in it at a lower price. Is that a bad thing to offer up or something maybe you've moved on from as a theme, you know, to, to offer it for less just to sort so of move it out? Like Is that not good? Discounting like skew, like a specific type or mm -hmm. thing that hasn't worked. Yeah, that, I mean, I'm not against that sort of discounting. It's just more of a, okay, we're gonna discount everything that we ever offer every you know, third month or whatever. Um, that gets tough, because then your best-selling SKUs are, sorry, items, like the things you're making all the time, those things are getting sold at a discount as well as your other stuff. If you need a clearance, so just to like distinguish them, discounting is just a general, big, the whole thing, um, versus clearancing something. So you don't want to make it anymore. It's not really working. I'd say clearance that. So discount it as much as you need to to get that money back in the coffers, making money for you as well as others. Um, we I, definitely discount things. I, I just want to. <laughs> Um, make a comment about this also. Something that I don't see a lot around here, but I see in more urban areas where there's a larger critical community is people self-editing their work. Um, here, when people make a work of art, they want to put it on the wall and they want everyone to love it. And we're in an area where when you play soccer, your kids play soccer, the team that wins gets trophies and the team that loses gets trophies. That's not the real world. I think it's really important to know when you have made a work of art that's successful and when you haven't. And if you have a bunch of stuff that hasn't worked, feel free to throw it out. You don't have to discount it because one of the things you want to keep in mind, and I don't know anything about your work, so this may not be relevant to you and I apologize if it isn't, but, but if, if you're not really psyched about what you did, don't forget when you discount it, someone's going to see your name associated with it. Me? I just as soon burn it. Do you want to come to our sales section? <laughs> I'll, I'll bring matches. It's a loss. Total loss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we, I've, I've, this has come up a, a couple times with the idea of, you know, as an artist, you're, you know, like Courtney was saying, you're asked to put stuff in uh, auctions and things like that. I know more and more artists are just like, no, I, I just don't do that because what if it sells for half the price of of what I normally sell for? That's now my price, you know, and uh, it doesn't actually work that way. Oh, okay. I, I mean, uh, I'm not saying work doesn't sell right. for, for a low amount of money, but that's not counted against their retail history. Right. And, and um, the way I look at that is, first of all, the organizations that, that I've been associated with that have done that, I've asked them to stop doing it. Because I think if you're trying to support artists, 
it doesn't make sense to have a parasitic relationship with them. And so we're asking them to give their children, essentially, to us so that we can feed our children, but we're supposed to be helping them. I find that to be, it's too parasitic. So, so I don't like it. However, organizations do sell art, and then 100% of that money goes to benefit the organization. So even if it's selling at a rate lower than what you normally would sell it for, all of that money is going to further a cause that hopefully you believe in, or else you wouldn't have done it to start with. So I, I do have a love-hate relationship to it. I will say that I've made a career out of getting work at a deep discount at a bunch of art organizations, auctions mm -hmm. in New York City. And it's a wonderful thing. Don't stop doing it. <laughs> about to say, and I have too, by the way. And I've, I've got a fair a few famous people that I could never afford otherwise. Yeah, including yeah. Duchamp, I would point out. Yeah. Jealous. Okay. Other questions? Christine. Thanks. Uh, Courtney, I'm wondering, a lot of the folks in the cohort are product-based, just like you, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your experience starting out and what you thought selling your jewelry would be like, and then how your business plan, specifically like the channels that you're in, direct-to-consumer, wholesale, consignment, et cetera, um, how that's played out for you and what you've learned along the way. Yeah. Um, well, I will say that the first time I went in to talk to someone about selling my work, I didn't have a price sheet, which was a huge mistake because uh, you have this self-talk and you're like, oh my God, what if I'm charging too much? And then you're already discounting your prices to yourself before you even like walked in the door. And what's the worst that can happen? You, you go with it on paper. I know this isn't exactly what you asked and I'll get there, but you go <laughs> with your, your price sheet on paper and that's your prices. And you, so for me, that was a, for a really good learning experience was have things on paper from square one because you really don't want to shoot yourself in the foot and say, oh God, now I'm like uh, tied into this order that I have that I'm like losing money on or just not making money on. Um, and then as far as the, the wholesale, the channels, I do, I do wholesale, I do um, direct to consumer like at the farmer's market or at the craft shows and then I do um, online sales and and so I have a website and I do keep track of where the the sales came from so did they come from the farm you know someone who found me on Google or did they come from someone that found me at the farmers market or you know how did someone find me and that way I can really keep track of where those sales actually came from because I consider even if it's an online sale if it came from someone that met me at the farmer's market, that's, you know, I kind of attribute it to the farmer's market because people do like to actually talk to you and, you know, see your work and see you in person and, and get that kind of relationship. Um, and so I think, I, I guess it's not all that different from what I thought it would be, but I definitely um, do pay attention to, um, especially the online sales and like where those are coming from um, and, and really keeping track of that. Um, and as my wholesale business grows, you know, that it just, that's just growing over time, which I was expecting and hoping for, and it, it's doing that. Um, and mm -hmm. I would say that the most challenging part of the product-based business is, for me at least, you know, if I'm going to say last weekend, you know, yesterday over the weekend, I was the Craft Vermont show. And so I'm there, I am anticipating this show. I have quite a diverse product line and I have to get a lot of inventory to see, to because I wanna have, I don't wanna sell out of stuff at 3 p.m. you know, on Friday. I mean, that would be nice, but um, then it would make for a really long and boring weekend. So I want to be prepared, and so it's think it's really understanding um, your products and knowing what sells, and then having the right inventory, which I still feel like is really really tricky. Um, so and it changes over time too. So people that saw me last year, or they've seen me at the farmers market, they expect me to have certain things, but maybe you know everyone's bought that necklace that wants it so i have to phase that out so i think it's really just paying attention to the trends and um c continuously revisiting that um you know 
however you do your inventory management. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did reach out to the national part of the Zantera, which is a, con a concessioner, and the bottom line was that my um, my work is too high end for them in most of their parks, just because it needs to be under glass instead of hanging on a rack, because the hanging on the rack things are you know ten, twelve, maybe fifteen dollars, and they didn't have the staffing to um, to work with my work. So I have been instead reaching out to boutiques that are in the areas of national parks, but that requires a lot of cold calling and things like that. So um, that's, that's something for January. Yes, that's hard to find, yes, actually. I know. Yeah, I've been working on that. I heard the, the word artist rep. Does, um, I know you'll have experience with that. Do either of you have experience with artist reps? Yeah, I mean, we work with um, a bunch of reps um, for many of our makers, and some of them ask us to go directly through the rep because it's easier for them because they get one big order on in their terms, and it's great. And then the rep knows us and how we like to order, and kind of works. So, what's the business model? Do they get a uh, percentage? It depends on the it depends on the rep, but most of them are taking a commission of their sales. Yeah. So. Um, if you have factored that into when you're pricing, great. Um, I think like a 10 to 15% is somewhat common, um, but it really depends on what sort of volume you're doing for them, so. Do you have an experience with artist reps? Um, to some degree, I, I mean, there are different kinds of reps, um, just as there are different kinds of uh, art worlds, and, and um, some reps um, just do straight sales, um, and, and they actually act like, um, traveling vendors for a group of artists or craftspeople, and, and some of them are regional, some of them cover larger areas. Um, but a lot of reps on the higher end are actually doing career counseling and uh, career development work, um, and sort of all rolled together into this sort of amorphous thing, and they get paid in many different ways. Some of them are very effective, most of them are not. Um, and um, it's like anything else. Um, the, the top veneer is very thin, but is really good, and everyone else is, is trying to create value for themselves where there isn't any. It's just like anything else, yeah. Interesting. How would you go about finding, well, this is a huge question, but A, how do you go about finding a gallery? But uh, let's start with artist reps. How would you find an artist rep? Um, I think the answer to both of those questions is the same, which, uh, well, um, observation, recommendation. I mean, word of mouth is always the best way to find anything. Mm -hmm. So if, if you um, have a friend or an acquaintance that has used someone, ask them how they like it and how it's worked for them and, and what their results were. Um, and I think the same is true with galleries. Galleries are a very similar kind of beast because um, there's a lot of charlatans in the industry because um, art, for those of you that don't know, is one of the last great unregulated industries in America. I'm, I'm kind of spanning both sides of that. In financial planning, I can't burp without having to give consumer protection uh, disclosures, um, but, uh, which is not a bad idea. But, but in the art world, um, you can just hang a shingle out and say, I'm gonna be, I'm running a gallery tomorrow and I don't know a thing about it, but don't you wanna work with me? And one of the things that I've discovered is a lot of gallerists that are less financially secure than the artists they're representing. And so here the artists are expecting to get paid and often it doesn't happen. And I don't mean to um, suggest that everyone's in that boat because there are a lot of really fine galleries. But there are a lot of galleries that appear to be fine for a really long time. Uh, there, was an, there was an example of a gallery just recently that had been around for close to 100 years, Nodler. Uh, which is a major gallery that was based in New York, and apparently they were complicit in a bunch of, um, of um, forgeries that they, they knew about, and there was about, uh, I believe it was $200 million in sales involved in this, and of course, when you have a few million dollars between friends, what happens is one day they're there and the next day they're gone. And they literally, this, this gallery just like packed up and was gone in overnight 
Um, they had been around for 85 years or 90 years or something like that. And they had a tremendous reputation, had put out a lot of scholarly catalogs, had done a lot of really good things in the art world, but you know, you're only as good as the last thing you did, and the last thing they did was really not good. Um, and so um, you just have to really be careful and do your homework. Someone here talked about checking in with vendors and asking how the work was doing. I, I would say no matter what level you're at, that's a really good piece of advice. If you've got um, five works of art at a gallery and each of the paintings is worth $30,000, it would behoove you to find out what's going on. Um, because you've got you know a couple hundred thousand dollars of inventory hanging around with someone who you think you know but you haven't seen in a while. Um, there's, there, was a, there was a gallery in Woodstock, Vermont called the Woodstock Gallery of Art, I believe. The guy that ran it, I can't remember his name right now. Do you, do you remember him? Um, he was the sweetest guy and he was, he was a crook. Um, and he did um, uh, archival services and he did framing and he did uh, paper conservation and he did all kinds of stuff. And he was really good at what he did. And then one day, um, all of a sudden there was this rumor mill and a couple of artists said you better go get your stuff and like two or three days later the place was closed up and he was gone and anyone that hadn't gotten their work it was gone you know and and there were there were all this all this work outstanding work that was at this gallery now you know for every every thing like that there's also you know um, probably a similar number of galleries that are really doing good work and very quietly going about their business and um, you know, making markets for, um, expanding markets, creating <coughs> markets for artwork and, and paying all of their uh, clients, which are the artists, you guys. Um, but um, you just have to, you know, I have this saying, you want a saying? Here's a saying. I always say you have to inspect what you expect. And um, I think that's good advice. So if you have expectations, you should check them out to see if there's any reality basis for them. It's always a good idea. So this actually, um, I don't know if you remember uh, uh, where your store is now. There was a gallery where I had my first big solo show. What was the name of that gallery? It turned out to be a Ponzi scheme, by the way. The guy, and, the guy who owned the marble works. Yeah, 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 that guy. And we had an opening, and I was like this new artist, and and you know, that was and where your first show was. That was my, one of my first shows. And you're still in the business. I think. <laughs> and and the 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 catering at this opening must have been a thousand, maybe oh, yeah. maybe fifteen hundred dollars. And all my friends came in and were like, "You're a star, man! This is so cool!" You know, and everything. And I didn't realize that he was robbing old ladies or something to, to do that. And I thought, I love the. That's why I'm here right. Now I love the art world. This is so cool, you know. And it turned out it was all correct. So, yeah. I, but you know, you must have waved some sage around when you came in oh, because you know, it's, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> many, many stories about what was what's in that building, but yeah. <laughs> so how how do you guys find you know how do you? Uh, do so my recommendation in terms of like reps would be to be your own rep until you really can't do it anymore. Yes, um, we good. definitely have a lot of people or a lot of makers that will. Um, jump into the rep game before they really need it. Um, right. And just scale, you gotta scale your business. Like. That's good advice. Do, you gotta be able to make, uh, yeah, I just, I think just, until you're, you've got a couple employees making the things for you, you shouldn't be really be looking at a rep, in my opinion. When you are getting to that point, what I would start off is I would go to other retailers or go to retailers that you are interested in. So say you like Commandeer, look at other places that, um, so say, Courtney, we could look at your stuff, so go see where else Courtney Records Jewelry is, sorry, I'm giving this like secret, um, where Courtney Records Jewelry is being sold to other boutiques. So you can go to Courtney's site, she probably has a place that, of a stockist, mm -hmm. so where people are stocking her go to those companies, look and see what kind of things they carry. Are they a good fit for you? Mm -hmm. And do that on repeat until you kind of find four or five boutiques or, or things to that effect that work for you and reach out to them specifically and say, hey, I'm a huge fan of Courtney Record Jewelry. I see that you carry it. Here's why I think my products would look great next to theirs. Or if it's not, if you're not in jewelry, find something else similar. Mm -hmm. You don't wanna be, it's kind of exactly what you were saying. It was picking the gallery, but if you're already being shown there, if your stuff is already very similarly right. fit in the same niche, find a reason why it's different 
and focus on that and make sure there's different differences enough. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. Uh, we, we used to call that resume surfing. Oh. You, you find an artist that you are, are similar to, but hopefully just a, like a, a, a nudge above you. And then, you know, our trick would be that you'd, you'd make friends with the artist. You'd call them and say, I love your stuff, you know, and everything. Yeah. Because as a curator, and I'm, and I'm wondering if it's the same thing for galleries, who do gallerists who don't have any time ask? They ask their artists who other good artists are. And, yeah. you know, and then Courtney says, yeah, I met this very cool artist whose stuff looks a lot like mine, so it's got to be cool, you know. And, uh, yeah. How do you find galleries? Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, sometimes people will recommend places to me. Now, I spend a lot of time at the farmer's market talking to people. It's like one of my favorite things. I go there and put my work out, and people see me, and they're like, oh, you should contact this place, you know? And so I I write them down, and then I contact that place. You know, they're like, your stuff would be great there, because I don't know all places. You know, there's so many places in the world. Um, Places around here, obviously, it's a little bit easier to know where your stuff might fit, but... If it's in California, I'm not in California. I don't know what places are um, selling, but I do. I will go find an artist that's similar to mine um, that might be selling at a place, and I go and see where their stuff is being sold. And then if those places have websites, because sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, um, you can see what kind of range of prices their stuff is and if it's similar and if the pictures of the place look nice. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, okay, no, don't want my stuff there. But... Um, and for a very long time, I would just cold call places, and I still do that, but um, it's, it can be a little tough, especially if you're an introvert, which I am. Um, so I would just smile and call places and, you know, just see what they said. And some, places, some people are just too busy to talk to you, and some people are really excited by what you're, what you're offering. So you get a few of those, and you realize, okay, you know, this is this could work, and and again, really unbusy times like Mondays at 10 a.m. The uh, the other thing is you have to know yourself about your own personality and your own strengths and weaknesses. Some some people who are artists are really in one hemisphere of their brain completely, and they sort of live existentially. You know, and and so when they go to try to market their own work, um, it can be not good. And, and so um, if you're one of those people, you might want to get a rep sooner. Um, or, <laughs> or, or, or a friend. Or, well, it doesn't have to be a rep rep. It could be anyone who, who can spell rep, you know, um, that's better at those skill sets than you are. Um, and, and also you have to figure out how much time, it takes a lot of time to market your work. <clears throat> and and um, some people have a hard time vacillating between the different hemispheres. And I think that's why a lot of people end up getting studios, because they don't want to have to keep putting away all the stuff that they worked on because it's dinner time. They want to have a table that they can leave their crap on like for days and days on end. You're smiling. You, you're one of those people. I can see that. And, and it's OK. It's OK. We're all among friends here. And, and, and some people you know, need a place that's dedicated to work so that they can, you know, when they leave, they can close the door. and do something else with their life, and, and they're not that good at compartmentalizing on their own. They need to close the door to compartmentalize. And so if you know those kinds of things about yourself, that's going to help you, because you might say things like, I suck at this. I'm not going to do that. And then, and then you find other ways of getting your work out there. I will say that I probably spend about 70% of my time working directly with artists and only about 30% of my time with galleries. Um, and so it is entirely possible um, that you can be found whether or not you have an outlet for your work that's conventional. Um, it depends upon finding someone who's really dogged and, and uh, persistent like I am, um, and they're not in everyday um, availability, but um, you know, you will, you, people will find your work if it's meant to be. But that may or may not be enough for you to build a career around. So you, just, again, have to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. I have a question uh, back to pricing. Um, the material I use in my tools are extremely expensive. And so they make a huge portion out of like, my, my piece. So I have to carefully price my labor. And I have 
often think I have just the, the, the amount that I can sell it for. And then people think a little bit, but they still buy it. Now, when I go into galleries, I have to do this times two, because they t take 50%, or if I go into stores. And that means um, it's not sellable anymore, or I have to use my price, and then I won't make any money. What do I do? Do I just go to galleries and just for the sake of it and think, just rather get my name out? I, I want to I hit that first. I'm sorry to break the tradition of like one, two, three, but I really want to address this because I've seen this before. First of all, it's a misthought. The, you know, sometimes it's not the wrong answer, it's the wrong question. Um, if you assume that because you're going someplace and you're only going to get half of the revenue, you need to charge twice as much, that is wrong. Okay? I'll be the first one to say that. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm also not saying you should just assume that you should. Things are not worth twice as much because of the magical doorway of the gallery. Okay? So sometimes they are. Sometimes galleries and, and other outlets have a marketplace that you just don't have access to, and it works fine. But sometimes it doesn't. So the rule of thumb is you shouldn't be selling things on your own for a different price than the gallery is selling it for. So there are gal if you were in New York City right now and it was known that you were with Gallery XYZ and your work was selling for $20,000 and you were selling it out of your studio for $10,000, the gallery would fire you. So the pricing has to be consistent um, it's sort of a variation of what you were talking about. The, ga the pricing has to be consistent. It doesn't become more valuable because, so this goes back to the drug theory. What you do is you start out charging the same amount and as the gallery is doing a good job hopefully and creating a market and then creating a larger market and creating more demand, the work will go up in price and eventually you'll get what you're looking for. Sometimes you have to make an investment in your career. That's the way life is structured. Realtors do it, doctors do it, Artists or professionals, you have to do it. Um, so you may end up not making the maximum amount of profit on each sale, particularly in the beginning. Too bad. Um, just to speak more to that, um, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, how, how do you know that the temperature is not there for those prices? Like, have you actually put those prices on your things and no one buys them? Or you just assume. So I, what I did now um, to the smaller pieces, I'm going to these holiday markets and so, and I sold, sell the smaller pieces there for the price that I think they are worth it, and I can sell them, but I know that I cannot bring these smaller pieces to a gallery because I would really, literally, just make the money back that the material would cost or my tools and everything. Right. Um, so I just. Uh, divided it so I the small piece goes to I sell directly from my gal from my uh, um, studio mm -hmm. or on market on, on holiday markets and the larger pieces go in the gallery I'm still losing money but I I, I add I didn't add 50% I added yeah, maybe just, 30 percent just kind of reiterate the consistency of the price that you're selling mm -hmm. as well as the price that they're selling it at I don't sell the big pieces myself anymore okay because I was I was so conflicted with what kind of yeah. work is it? what what kind of work is it's it? fused glass fused glass okay so I would I would just see with the smaller pieces you know take a chance and increase your prices at one of your markets and see how much less you sell or if it even makes sense. I figured that out. I know. Okay, I found know the, the okay. sweet spot. Yeah. You found the sweet spot. Yeah. 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 And, you know, Al, as a store owner, I'm going to be curious okay, were you able to sell these larger items yourself? And if you say no, I'm only selling them in a gallery setting or a, a store setting, I'm going to have a tough, tough time making the yeah. commitment there. Um, but, I, you know, I would go to galleries and higher end places that are selling similar things and see where their prices are at. And I, I found a sweet spot for the big pieces too before okay. I went into galleries and now I raise the prices in, in the so it's, that I make a little bit money but now it's not selling Just anymore. Just make sure, so. yeah, I, it's tough. Yeah. I, yeah. I know you're in a tough yeah. spot but you have make to, sure you make money. Yeah. You have to, you have to um, figure out where the value added is, right? So. If you're, if you're going to a gallery and they're not selling for you, someone's not necessary. You know, that's their job. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so, and it, it, it may not be because they're not working hard. It may be they really don't have a market for it. Oh, yeah. And you should keep trying to find another yeah. gallery perhaps that mm-hmm. does a better job, has more potential, has a different market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? What, is, what do you think a, an artist should charge for labor for him, like to himself? What, what is a, a good... It, that's a tough. That's yeah. a tough question. I don't. I don't even yeah. believe in the concept. Okay. <laughs> I, I, the, the work is what um, you know. It, when you put a swimming pool in your house and it costs you two hundred thousand dollars to do it, you know you're not going to get that back. I, I don't think the labor is the issue because you could put a lot of time into something and it's a dog when you're done with it. Mm-hmm. So at the end you have this thing and this thing has a price and it's worth and worth X. And you have to figure out what X is, but it can't be based on the labor. You know, people do pictures and they put a beautiful frame on it, and they're going to charge a lot more because it's a beautiful frame. I get the piece, I take the frame off and throw it out and do something different. There's certain things that contribute to pricing, certain things don't. I don't believe labor is one of those factors because art isn't a direct line relationship with garbage in, garbage out. It's like you're, you've got a concept, you've got an idea, you've got some magic that happens, and then you've got this beautiful, amazing, challenging, whatever it is visionary work at the end, and that's what people are attracted to. They don't want to know how much time you put into it. So you just have to figure out, your, your time is sort of silent, and you know you have to love what you do as part of being an artist. And just to give the opposite side of that, um, I think your stuff might dip more into the art, art world, is what I'm kind of guessing, because it's like one of a kind pieces that you're spending a lot of time on. Um, but for someone, you know, we work with some people that make kids clothing, I won't say any specific names, but her time is real, like she's making the same thing over and over Production's again. And yes, different, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of production, I would really value your labor. Yes. Um, I wouldn't overvalue it. You know, we have a lot of makers that come from the corporate world and they're expecting to make that sort of money in making their first year out. It's gonna be a tough one, but you can grow up to that for sure. And you know, Courtney, you're, you're increasing your prices over time. That makes sense. You should be increasing your prices over time, but just make sure you inform your retailers. <laughs> so, we know, uh, so we know, like when we reprice something, you know, um, that happens. But I, I think like you know, the art world is definitely super hard to quantify a price and don't put your labor into that pricing. But when you get into that production, like for instance, if you're taking that art and making prints of it, make sure you're covering your material costs of making that print. And then the startup, the the art part, and then your time of making that, producing that print, like right, y- you know, very. The production is a different animal. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. And then oh. please don't make prints of your paintings. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, the, I, I heard this um, uh, a contemporary artist say that the art is what I can't pay somebody else to do. So there's this idea that when you're doing fine art or contemporary art, that you're, it has to be you know your the sweat of your brow, and, and that's. Not true. It turns out that's not true, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, there have been gallery assistants for thousands of years. Um, other questions, yeah. Uh, this one is for uh, Sarah. For a new artist that's walking into your gallery, obviously you're going to look at the portfolio, but is there something else you'd want to see from them that would kind of help you make a decision as to we want to work with this artist? Like, not necessarily like a business plan, but maybe a business plan or something. Um, so just to start off from the beginning, please don't walk in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you, it, every store is unique and every gallery is going to be unique, but um, what most stores of our size are trying to accomplish on a day-to-day basis, we can't, we can't take you in that capacity. However, we would love to set up a meeting if we think it's a great fit. So on our website, this is specific to us, on our website we have like a Uh, maker and vendor inquiries. We explain everything that we're looking for. Um, First and foremost, line sheet. Give us your sell sheet. Have your prices set on there. Uh, What you're selling them for retail. We, the first thing we look at, do we have that full margin on there? And if we don't, ooh, we better really like it. Shout out to Haley in the back. I loved Haley, I'm just gonna speak to you for a second. I love Haley's earrings yeah, and jewelry. I, um, I was willing to take a chance on her. Her production costs are, were higher than we could go. Um, or sorry, yeah, the margin, we couldn't get our full margin, but 
for me, I'm willing to make some certain chances on certain makers because I just really like where their head's at and where they're going and their spunk or their like just fire to get out there. Oh, so, so yeah. So um, yeah, so know, know your prices and know your brand and like why it's a really good fit for the store. Um, like Courtney said, like we want to make money as well as you make money. We have a huge store that we have to pay for employees and stuff. So don't think that that 50% is going to nothing. Like we are barely breaking even most days. Um, so after you've not walked in, but you've emailed us or... <laughs> So, so let's be clear about this for a second. Sorry. By the way, no, I just, I'm laughing because a when I was a curator, that, that used to drive me freaking crazy yeah. because, you know, um, confession, I never gave a show to anybody who ever walked in. And I never gave a show to people who just sent slides without calling and arranging yeah. a meeting and stuff like that. It just doesn't happen, you know. So. We're super gracious. We totally understand that, like, yeah. you are putting yourselves out there and have, like, really psyched yourself up. So we're, we're not going to be, like, get out of here. But we will hand you a sheet that explains what we're looking for. Um, so... <laughs> and it, it, you know, we're not we're not trying to be assholes. Sorry, but like it, we are trying to you sell have, the shit. You don't have all time. The you don't, no, yeah. we have no time. time right. Um, but we really want your best work, and when you're presenting it to us, and so uh, having us be able to look at it and then be like, "Ooh, yeah, I really like that. I want to. I want to see that. I want to see samples, or we'll just place an order like blindly, like from seeing it on your website." You've saved time, we've saved time, and you've made an order. So, um, yeah, so all of our information is on our website, and it is different than every other store out there, I bet. Um, but I would really hold um, having that sell sheet really dialed and simple, and this is what this one's priced at, here's a picture of it, here's what I describe it. Here's the, oil, like, if it's jewelry, here's the metal. If it's wood, here's the wood. Like, explain it. Really simple. Here are my best sellers. Please work with me. Like, yeah. Hi. Thanks for um, speaking tonight. I have a uh, sneaking suspicion, and I'm hoping you can either um, kind of steer me in the right direction, whether that be affirming my suspicion or countering my suspicion. Um, in terms of... Uh, getting my standard prices known. I work in fine art, not in, in product. I've had a few clients in the past six months reach out to me uh, after they saw some work at a show, and they wanted to wait until the show was over <laughs> and purchase directly from me, so I got the full price. And I encouraged them to buy from the venue. Um, just because I am suspicious that you all talk behind the scenes, and I'm hoping that my prices will get known as at a certain rate through the venue rather than through me. And I just, I, I just want to know how much you all talk about that kind of stuff. I will assume you're directing this question to me. <laughs> and um, and I, I will say that um, um, I speak with everyone I can all the time but usually not about that. I, I generally don't talk about the prices that I pay for works. I don't think anybody, except for my registrar, knows, and I guess my girlfriend knows. Actually, she doesn't know most of the time, now that I think about it. Um, she would probably faint if she knew how much I spent on art. But, but um, my registrar knows because we have to note it on the inventory. Um, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't really talk about it. Um, and I personally think that's one of the advantages of working with a, a serious collector is that they keep their mouth shut. But, but um, I was unclear about your question, so I want to let me let me see if I understand. Someone approached you after a show closed at a gallery, I assume, and and wanted to to get to. The show was and you said no. Oh, um, uh, but this must be in Vermont then, right? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking yeah. Okay.
I'm playing a longer game, okay. it seemed more valuable for me at the time to try to establish the sale through the venue. So there was no discussion of discounting of the work. No. It was just a question of whether they bought it through SVAC or bought it through you directly. Yeah. Okay. So um, I know I'm on tape. So uh, <laughs> let me let oh, me. By the way, we're videotaping it. I know. I realize that. Okay. that. But let me just say that um, there's different kinds of galleries, and um, galleries that represent you are different than. I'm, there are very few commercial galleries in Vermont. Most of them are nonprofit regional art centers which operate very differently, have different goals, and, and um, obviously, you know, if you want to, you're the kind of an artist that they all would want to have because you're actually supporting them by suggesting that this person buys. I don't really understand why the person, usually when someone is approaching an artist to buy something after a show closes, the assumption is that they're gonna be able to purchase it for less than it was at the gallery, and, and, and maybe they won't, take a 50% discount on it, but if, even if they took a 20% discount, you would still end up with more money than you would have had if you were selling it through the gallery, and the person that is playing the role that I generally play would be paying less. So that's a different dynamic than what you just described. In the, in the dynamic that you described, the market value of the work's the same. I don't know what the advantage is from the purchaser's perspective, I think. I think just supporting me because she's purchased from me before. Yeah. Just tell her to keep buying. Yeah, I think you did the right thing. Yeah, I would second that. I know you're fine art, um, but you know your your heart was in the right place in terms of wanting to support the organization. It was Vermont Art Center. Where Southern Vermont Art Center. Okay, so wanting to foster that relationship. You know, you never know who's going to say something to so and so, but um, we see it all the time. It's called showrooming. So essentially, someone will come into our store and be like, "Oh, I love that. I'm going to go buy it from their website," and I'm like. So we got to stay in business to be able to support that maker. So, yeah. Um, so you know, understanding retail as a maker, retail, retail is tough very tough. Very um, tough yeah. And understanding as a maker, if you're posting about stores that carry, you're posting about you know where you're going to be at a farmers market. It's it's great because they can see your product. Like that's super important. Like they saw that work in person and loved it there. So, you know, wanting to make sure that foster that relationship so that you're invited back, I think, was spot on. Um, I, I will say though that I don't think I don't think what you did one way or the other is going to influence your capacity to show in the place in the future. And had you sold it directly to that person, I don't think it would have hurt your opportunities to show there in the future. I really believe that. Um, I still think you did the right thing ethically. Um, I will also say, though, that if th it sounds like there's a person that's purchased from you before and you have a relationship with them. So, um, you know, if, if that person originally found you not through SVAC, for example, um, it's fair game for them to approach you directly. Um, and it's also fair game for you to say, why don't you come and have a studio visit? I'd love to show you some other work, but that works up there now. You saw that one through them you know, bingo, bango. I, myself, will often, um, f I, n actually not that often, but once in a while I'll find work in a gallery and if I like it, I'll buy it from the gallery and I do like to work with artists because I like to talk with them and find out what they're thinking and, and what they're all about and I'll just make a relationship with that, art with that artist. If the gallery represents them and they have an exclusive that's different, they're usually in the mix then, but otherwise, I just work directly with the artist after maybe the first one or two sales through the gallery because I feel like I've earned that. Yeah, uh, yeah and by the way, curators and galleries, we all talk to each other. So, you know, um, so I've, I've had artists where, you know, um, yeah, if somebody screws me, I, I, I'll tell all my friends who are curators that, that, you know, that's probably not somebody they want to work with. And I actually had a gallery do this. What was it? Fred Tomaselli. We had a piece by Fred Tomaselli yep. at one of my shows. And I discovered afterwards that, um, this is at Burlington City Arts, that it had sold for, I think, four hundred or $500,000 right afterwards to a, a Stowe collector. And the gallery, the gallery was supposed to pay us a cut, and they didn't. Ow. Yes. Wow. I read on. Okay. Um, 
Uh, this question is mostly for Sarah. Uh, I'm curious how how you go about talking to people who come into your store about the pricing. I, I've never been in. I've walked by like at night when it's closed. Um, they're like, ooh, that looks nice. Um, but you know, I'm assuming you know that things are priced higher than Walmart. And how do you talk to people? How do you educate people about the value of what they're getting mm -hmm. in your store versus like I'm sure you all the time have people come in and go, oh, that's really expensive. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. like, oh, I could get something cheaper at Walmart mm -hmm. or wherever. So you know, how do you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of what we do is consumer education, uh, explaining, okay, so that thing's not made overseas. That's made by maybe one of our neighbors. You know, it's labor does come into that of like this is a fair wage because we know that someone is making this with their life you know um so there's a lot that goes into that um and kind of meeting each customer where they're at you know you're definitely not going to be able to convince every customer you know we have people that will come in and kind of yell about it and we're like that's fun um uh, <laughs> these prices ah and i'm like okay well we have things for every price point oh what like what are you looking to spend like well you know what's your category like obviously we won't say you must be looking to go next door where the yelling is going on <laughs> <laughs> yes yes um so it is definitely a lot of consumer education um but understanding that you know we're not trying to shove it down people's throats um about being usa made some canada but usa made um yeah, it's a, it's we're not trying to make someone only buy USA made, so uh, it's definitely tough. But there's a lot of lots of education of every consumer that comes in, and then there's the fact that we're in this market that we're in. Um, Vermonters and Burlingtonians are very obsessed with buying something that was made locally, so they already get it. Um, if we were in a different uh, market, I would think that we're going to have to have a lot more education um, to get there, but people already are going to those farmers markets and wanting to meet the maker and actually talk to them. So you've already got that on on this side. Um, and then also in general, like the trend is moving towards that. Uh, we're moving a lot more towards like transparency in our production um, and manufacturing. Uh, so that's helpful. So, um, but in general, you'd be surprised that pricing is a problem, but once they understand what went into it and that it's fairly created, their understanding of where that price comes from quickly, they're like, oh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll buy it. <laughs> all right, cool, great. <laughs> Not today, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> okay, cool, great. We have time for about Fun. one or two more, yes. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, as an artist who also often has sometimes two, three jobs um, and a life, uh, what is the time frame in terms of when you're making initial contact with a store and following up if you don't hear back, as well as if somebody approaches you to, you know, get something or they want more information, how, like, what is the acceptable time frame to respond. Um. Oh, sure. Yeah, I have for both of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question, but I will answer it anyway. Um, because I just, like a few weeks ago, separated my business and personal email. And that was like for my own mental health because I'm working all the time. And it's like, if, if I get an email at 10 p.m., I'm gonna answer it, you know, because I don't like to have things on my to-do list. And I already have a to-do list that's so large that if I can answer an email really quickly, I'll do it. So uh, <laughs> I just do it really quickly because that's my personality, but um, I think it's acceptable to <laughs> not have an instantaneous So response. the reason why I was giving that to you is um, I think that you reached out to us the first time probably, how long do you think it was from when you first reached out to us to, mm. yeah, there was probably like a year or two in between. Yes. yes. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> in fact, I'd given up. <laughs> this is true. This is very true. I think when you first reached out to us, you weren't in the place of knowing exactly, okay, I know that these things sell. I know this is the right price. Um, and then you circled back. I think you might have walked in. So shh, don't do that. <laughs> no, I think actually, no, I saw, I reached out to you. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I stumbled upon you because you had grown at that point. I was like, shoot, why didn't I like grab that at the like beginning chance at that time? But um, so, you know, I don't think there's a perfect like time frame like yeah. for the production product side. By the way, it sounds more, uh, that's interesting. It sounds like you were building a relationship rather than, it's not this one time I reach out and then no. that, I mean. And we don't ever tell anyone no. Right. We're like, okay, we're fully stocked for that category. Like there's no open to buy at this point, but like let it, we'll be there. Like just give us some time to sell through some bags and like we're willing to take a, take a gamble. And, like, and if every gambles. couple months they sent you an email saying, hey, I got some new things on my, you know, and they just sort of reminded you if, if it's, you I don't. Know. I would unsubscribe personally. Um, like I would stop, not even just like unsubscribe, like the button, I would just like see it come through and be like, nah, like it's too much. Um, but Courtney kind of like, like really worked on her brand and like really got her products to the point and she was putting herself out there in so many different ways and I was seeing it everywhere. I was like, hmm, this is actually really great and it, like I'm willing to take this gamble again, like actually buy and you know, it's been really successful for us. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, build the relationship is exactly what you're saying. Yeah, and I didn't just for the record. I didn't walk in the first Same. time. That's your oh, yeah, <laughs> I did. I just walked in to check in. My stuff yes, was already there, so that was just a check-in walk-in. <laughs> <laughs> but I have other stores. I have just walked in, I, and it's you yeah. know they don't yell. Just know every store. Yeah, we don't yell. <laughs> Sometimes it works out, but not there. Definitely not there. <laughs> but in February on Monday, Monday mornings, cool. totally but, cool. But only one of you can go because there's that one time slot. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we have talked about doing like an open pitch kind of situation, which yeah, could we be would a totally really, do that here. That yeah, would be that would, that would be, be really fun for crazy us cool. and yeah. on on a Monday morning. And, and I'll buy the beer and pizza. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Ooh, pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, open pitch would be like you go to get up in front of a crowd um, and actually pitch your things. I, you know, could, or, you know, amongst your peers, you're getting up there and, you know, you, know, you don't have to talk about prices. You're just like, here are my things. Here's why they're cool. Um, you know, you get a bunch of retailers, kind of like a small trade show, Vermont, Burlington style. That's kind of my vision. Maybe I'll build I it. I love with, it. That's great. So like Petra Kucha. Yeah. Because we do something for companies called Pitch It Fab It, and, and we do exactly the same thing, except for they're pitching. They want us to fund them starting a whole company. You know? Yeah, so exactly. That's, that's super cool. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one more question. Does anybody have a... Oh, there's a burning question in the back. Okay. Okay, here's a question for you guys. Um, what do you think about... Um, pricing for the uh, market that you're aiming at rather than for what you've been able to sell in the past. So like you, like, you know that there's a market up at Stowe that can afford this type stuff. And so what do you think about, how does that fit into any reality? All right, so. <laughs> So having checked with my colleagues, let me see if I can stab this uh, question in the eye. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that markets are as distinct as you've suggested they are. I don't find the market in Stowe in general bears more prices, higher prices, than the market in Montpelier or the market in Burlington. Um, they may have better sell-through for certain types of things, that appeal to the people that happen to be there. Um, um, just a very quick story. I was in New York City, and um, and there was this beautiful drawing, and it was two hundred dollars. And I come back home, and there was a drawing that wasn't quite anywhere like that 
and the artist wanted eight hundred dollars, and I had to. And they were like, but it's really worth it. You don't know how much time I've put into it, you know, that whole thing. And I said, well, let me just tell you a story. I was just in New York, which is sort of like the belly of the beast in the United States for art, and I bought a drawing that was twice the size, and it was beautiful. And this artist is a mid-career artist, and they were represented by a gallery. And you know how much I paid for it? I'm like, no, it's two hundred dollars. And they're like, I almost fell over backwards, you know. And and so there's this there's this um, pervasive line of thought that goes something like this. The grass is always greener in, and the answer is wherever you're not. So I don't believe in that. On the other hand, if you have done something specific to approach a different market, and you have work that's specific to that market, and you can demonstrate that that market's attracted to it, and that there are different prices associated with that market, it's a good idea. But in general, just putting higher prices on things and hoping that you know, someone that's looking for a half a million dollar house is going to buy it instead of the two hundred thousand dollar house. You know, you're not the M. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but you you don't you're not the MLS. You don't have the marketing ability to grab that person and say you really want a half million dollar house. I think that it's hard. You know, basically, if you've never done something before, there's a reason for that. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but. Um, who, who was it? Einstein said, "Doing the same thing and expecting a different result is a symptom of insanity." You know, so I think that just putting a different price on something and thinking, you know, it's going to be in stone now, it'll be okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't build a business plan around that. I guess I was thinking about those pop-up galleries in Southampton and St. Arts, where people do focus the art on, you know, to that market. Yeah, that's nothing like Stowe. Um, you know, and and um, and that's really a destination. Like, it's really hard to be on St. Bart's unless you flew there. You know, I mean, Stowe gets all kinds of people, and some of them have money, and some don't. Some are pretending. I mean, I mean, it's a very different kind of market. Yeah. So, do you guys have any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Don't walk in. No, just kidding. <laughs> what are you um, thinking? Yeah, I don't want to be super aggressive about like not showing your things because I think it's important to put your stuff out, out there. there. Just yeah. know <laughs> <laughs> just know your right. know your know who you're going in. Do your do your research and see how they want to be approached um, is the most is very important. Um, because every every store is gonna be unique. Um, and then another thing in terms of zip code uh, Make sure that you know you're not already saturating the market, so you're not working with a retailer that's around the corner. Um, so that's again with researching. Figure out which retailer in a community you really want to work with, who's doing that education and doing the hard work of getting the makers and continuing to reorder from the same makers. Um, you can ask your friends, you know who's been a good partner, who's done a lot of reorders, that is important. Um, so I think just really doing your research and figuring out who you wanna put your time and effort into and then put your time and effort into them. Um, I think Courtney's a good example of, she put time and effort into our relationship and it panned out. Yeah, <laughs> versus like sending a blanket email to like, 50 retailers. We know it's a blanket email. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I guess on that note, sort of following up a little bit on what you said, I think um, it's okay also to say no. Like, because I think there are, there are definitely a few places that I worked with that maybe I shouldn't have worked with them. Or there is a place I reached out to a, a catalog and they, were, they, reached, they responded, they were like, yes, we want your stuff. And, but the terms were so bad, I just could not, I was like, oh, but it's a catalog. And, but then I just ended up saying no with Gwen's support. Um, and <laughs> my, my cheerleader in the back, the um, charge more and say no. Um, but it's okay also if it doesn't feel like a good fit. You don't have to say yes to everyone. I mean, there are those, it's just, it may feel like, oh, I gotta say yes because I really want my stuff somewhere, but 
it's if it's not the right place, then it is okay to say no because it's all about again coming back to respecting yourself and and feeling confident in your work and really wanting to represent your you're having your brand represented the way you want it to be represented. So that's it. Hint number twenty three. <laughs> um, if you're not doing production work or you're doing production work and the unit price is very high, keep track of who's buying your work. Make sure you know who's buying your work. Even if it's sold through a gallery, try to get them to tell you who bought their work. The most logical client mm -hmm. is the person that already bought from you. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. I want to thank the three of you. It's been very informative, wonderful. I want to thank Gwen and back, Wave your hand. Say, say hello, Gwen. Center for Women and Enterprise, my co-director co, uh, of this program, who's been fantastic to work with, and, uh, and, I, and I can't wait for next year. Um, so uh, one, uh, one quick other thing I want to mention is, uh, this is uh, Jumpstart Business of Art. We actually have opened the application process for our next Jumpstart, which is focused on companies that are growth focused, and uh, that's actually gonna start in January, but the application process is open now, it's online, so if you know anybody who's got a... Now, okay, now, now, okay. <laughs> Tag us, tag us. So, uh, if <laughs> so, anyway, if you know anybody who's who start, is starting a company, we literally we, we essentially pay you to start a company here. You know, we go out and raise money to be able to support people like uh, the cohort and uh, and support them. And so, yes, if you've got an idea, Mark, we should talk. Um, so, uh, it's a great program, and I'd encourage uh, you to invite your friends to apply. Thank you. <laughs>